fruit trees can be beautiful and they can also be productive, but fruit trees can take up a lot of space. So if you have a small garden, you might think you don't have room for a fruit tree, but there are ways to grow small fruit trees in small spaces. And one option is to grow your fruit trees espalier style. Espalier fruit trees are trained to grow up against a fence, sort of like fruiting walls. All you need to grow one of those at home is a sunny backyard. So today we are going to talk about espalier fruit trees with Ron Perry, PhD. Ron is a retired professor emeritus of horticulture from Michigan State University. So Ron, welcome to the show today. Uh, nice to be with you. I am so glad you're here, and I have lots of questions about espalier fruit trees, but let's start off with the simple one. What exactly is espalier? So espalier is a system that uh, basically was developed originally by the Romans and then further developed in the Middle Ages. Um, and really it was the French who coined the term espalier um, and really used it uh, in around the 14 and 1500s in the various chateaus and estates uh, in France. Um, usually it was done in order to save space in a garden so that they would generally have open space um, for full sun, developed for um, vegetables and other crops that they needed for their estate or for their castle. Um, and then the walls, uh, became uh, a support system, if you will, for uh, fruit trees. Incredible. So the idea is you've got your sunny garden in mm. this chateau or castle, and it's surrounded by walls. And along the walls, there's this two, these two-dimensional fruit trees. So they're not shading your cabbages or your potatoes or your tomatoes. So they are there. They are producing fruit. The question is, how productive are espalier fruit trees? Well, first of all, it starts with understanding um, the type of tree you're growing and then the type of rootstock you're using uh, to be able to grow that tree on. So some people may not be aware that when fruit trees are propagated in the nursery, they're actually propagated on specific types of rootstock. So it's a totally different gen genetic component usually accomplished in the nursery. Um, that particularly a below ground component, we call the rootstock, the above ground, we call that the scion. That rootstock can be selected for many purposes, but one of them as a key role would be in espalier would be for dwarfing. So we have a number of rootstocks in apples and pears, sweet cherry, not so much in many others, maybe some plums, that can make the canopy of the tree much smaller. Gotcha. Okay, so the idea is that we want to use a rootstock that will keep our tree compact, so we're not fighting with it, you know, to keep it small. What's the worst that could happen if you bought any old fruit tree on a whatever rootstock and it's the wrong rootstock? How, what, what are the biggest problems you could encounter? That's the most common nightmare because there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, there are a few things we can do that our commercial orchardists deal with all the time, where they have uh, too close a spacing for uh, the trees they've selected and of course the rootstock they've selected. So they might actually go in and root prune, for example, or they may do a lot of hedging in order to keep the tree within space dynamics. Um, but once you get into a garden area and you only have a few trees, and if you just go out and select any tree and not paying attention to the rootstock that's utilized, then what can happen is the tree can be extremely vigorous and then you spend a lifetime of fighting its vigor. And that's something you do not want to do. So whenever someone sends me a question about the trees and how do I get rid of water sprouts, the first thing I do is start asking questions about what rootstock they have the tree planted on and determine whether or not it still can be restored. If it's the wrong rootstock and it's a little too vigorous, that's a problem and you probably need to remove it and start again. So here we have this two dimensional design 
And the two dimensional design will, uh, you'll use the arms of the fruit tree, you will train them or tie them to the fence in some design or the other. Can you describe some of the espalier designs that we can create with fruit trees? Probably the most common is just the simple, um, just the simple uh, grid of uh, horizontal arms. Uh, you might have several of them, and those arms might be anywhere from uh, 10 to 14 inches apart, or somewhere around 30 to 40 centimeters apart in verticality. And you might have several of those arms, if you will. That's the most common one. So you have a central leader or a central trunk, and then those radiating off into those arms. Uh, there are others. There's the fan, where basically the central trunk is cut low, and then you force branches to come up at oblique angles from that. Um, another that's fairly common is the candelabra, where you uh, elevate one branch and then you turn it at certain points to get verticality on the branch and it looks like a candelabra. Probably the more fourth most common would be something like the, the cordon or bilateral cordon you see in grapes where you have one horizontal arm and then several shoots that go up vertically from that horizontal arm and then grow them. This is commonly done in a lot of the vinifera type grapes um, but not too often in uh, uh, fruit trees. Okay, well, we have some questions already. Okay. So we've got our questions, a bunch of questions from John. So John says, uh, he, three, first question, do you have any last hope resuscitation techniques for an apple espalier that hasn't leafed out by the end of spring? I have an established espalier that has failed to leaf out this year, yet the cambium seems to be still green in places. How do you check for sure if the tree is dead or can be saved somehow? So if you will cut into, um, on, a, on an angle into a branch and see if you've got any green cambium, you'll see that right below the bark. And if it's green, you're okay. If it's brown, you've got a problem. You probably have dead wood and you need to prune all the way back till you find green cambium again. If you don't find it, then you're best starting over again. Okay, his second question. Do you have any tricks up your sleeve to force a reluctant apple espalier into fruiting? He says, I have a 10-year-old Belle de Boscoop espalier on EMLA M26 dwarfing rootstock. This year is the first year it had any flowers and it only had three flowers. I've read online that Belle de Boscoop can be slow to bear, but this seems an abnormally long time. Any theories or ideas? Well, the first theory is you got the wrong rootstock. It's on M26. So M26 is a little more vigorous and it takes longer to come in productive productivity than M9 or Budagowski 9 or CG11 or any of these more dwarfing rootstocks. These dwarfing rootstocks are not only dwarfing, they make the trees more precocious. So they start to flower and fruit much earlier in the life of the tree than on M26 or M7. So that's one of the problems that's causing that. Um, it is a variety that comes into bearing late like Northern Spy. There's really not a whole lot you can do about it, except one thing. And that is if, uh, in, in springtime and bloom time, you can go in and girdle uh, the trunk of the tree um, usually use a, a hacksaw blade uh, a width that'll go right down to the wood. Um, if you do it during that period, that's a, a girdling period, you can actually start to get that tree. And uh, basically you're causing stress to put that tree into some amount of stress. When a tree goes into stress, it starts going into a reproductive cycle. So some girdling probably right about now, or you may be just getting past it in that window opportunity. We have fruit growers that do that all the time. So basically, Ron, you are suggesting that John actually hurt his tree, cut yep. into it, yep. but you wouldn't cut all the way around, would you, if you've got yeah, the branch? A, and you... No, it's girdling. Girdling is <gasps> all the way around. Wow. And instead of cutting off its source of nutrition, you're hoping it's going to fruit. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, that sounds very harsh. Okay, a yep. couple more quick questions from John. Uh, can, and oh, this is linked. He says, can Annapolis Bollier accidentally be girdled and killed if a tear branch, one of these arms, is tied to its bamboo support too tightly? Or can an espalier only be girdled and killed if the main trunk is girdled low down? So it depends on what the tie is. If the tie is elastic, then no. If the tie is not elastic, for example, rope or wire or something like that, yeah, you can girdle it and do exactly what I was explaining earlier about using a hacksaw blade and, and cutting a groove into the bark down to the wood. So girdling can do that, but once again, it depends on the type of tie you're talking about. Okay, and he has one last question. This is a great uh -huh. one. Okay, if you could only grow one apple espalier in your small space garden, what would your number one choice be based on disease resistance and, of course, great taste? Well, that's Honeycrisp. Oh, really? That's an easy, easy answer. Hmm. So Honeycrisp is one or um, another one is Gold Rush. Um, the flavor isn't the greatest in compared to, comparison to Honeycrisp. Another is Crimson Crisp. These all three are moderately resistant to a scab. And that, the Honeycrisp is moderately resistant to scab. Uh, Gold Rush and Crimson Crisp are uh, completely scab resistant. So what you wanna start with is a variety that is scab resistant. I've got another one that I'm growing called Enterprise, uh, comes from the New York Cornell program that is uh, scab resistant. Uh, Liberty, if the, a lot of folks in the New England area grow Liberty apple and Liberty is scab resistant. So you first wanna choose a low maintenance variety, maintenance meaning trying to take care of uh, in insects and diseases, but mainly uh, diseases. You really can't do much with variety selection for uh, insect resistance. Gotcha. Okay, we've got a question. Next question is from Howard. Uh, Howard is listening to us in Ottawa. So Howard says, hello, Susan, very interesting topic today. Is this technology used here in Canada? Uh, and he's, I guess, referring to uh, Espalier. And the answer is yes, so for sure. Yeah, I'm sure of it because um, I had a colleague uh, from New Brunswick who was from uh, Quebec, who basically uh, was one of our colleagues in what's called the NC140 Regional Project for years. And I got to know him pretty well. And he would report on the various rootstock trials he would use and high density systems. In fact, there was a new variety developed at the Harrell Research Station um, called uh, by Harold Kwame called um, called uh, Ottawa 3 um, just for that. The problem was it wasn't as big, uh, excuse me, dwarfing as it probably they wanted it to be. Um, it was more on the M26 to M7 class range as far as influence on dwarfing. And so it really never saw much of the light of day, but you can probably still get Ottawa 3 in Canada in a, a Canadian nursery, but it is more cold hardy, um, can do well. The problem is it's just a little too vigorous for a spalier. Gotcha. So again, if we, what we're thinking, we need to think ahead. If we want to plant a spalier, we want to make sure our root stock is dwarfing enough. So we'd, yeah. we would do that research and we want to make sure it's an appropriate cultivar. Our next question is fantastic to follow up. It's from Barb in Seattle. Barb writes, I work in a public garden and I'm rehabilitating a simple cordon fence of about 15 different apple cultivars. So a spalier cordon style. Mm -hmm. Many of them seem to be tip bearing varieties so right. that they don't bear fruit well when pruned as an espalier. Yeah. So here's her question. My question, do you have a list of apple cultivars that absolutely will not be productive when espalier pruned or conversely, which apple cultivars are most productive when trained as an espalier? So I think you're going to need to explain to us a little bit about tip bearing apple trees. Yeah, terminal bearers, that's the term we use for uh, terminal bearing varieties or tip bearing. That means that the apical bud of a shoot is where all of your reproductivity is and it's usually gonna be a little bit longer shoot. Just to clarify, the apical bud is the, the last- bud. The last the bud last on the bud, branch. The last yeah. bud on a branch. 
And uh, uh, probably a classic one of that is the Cortland. Another one is the Rome. Those are two older varieties that are uh, terminal bearers. They would not be as good a variety in that system as varieties like Yala, for example, that'll actually produce fruit on last year's lateral wood. Um, you, you want a variety that has a lot of spurs that are, in other words, short shoots that are reproductive. Cortland and Rome are not gonna be that way. Um, if you have those, then the only choice you have is during the growing season, try to get as many of those branches to bend down below the horizontal mm, by using rubber bands or whatever it takes to get them down below the horizontal as they're being developed, as they're succulent, get them to go downward. Then what'll happen is they'll be more reproductive. And plus you get the branch under control. It'll start to slow down. Anytime you get a branch below horizontal, you basically slow its extended uh, branch growth rate. Fascinating. So by bending that branch that's supposed to be on the horizontal wire, yeah, and we're pulling it down below horizontal, we're just trying to slow its growth so that yeah. we don't have to cut off the tip of yeah. the branch yeah. when we prune it so that we will have an apple at the tip of the yeah. branch. Another but, way to do it, another mm -hmm. way to do it is to fool that branch into thinking that it has fruit on it. So fruit on a branch by gravity will come down below the horizontal. And then so fruit begats fruit. That means that that branch will continue to be more of a reproductive cycle for the future. Um, we have a number of fruit growers I used to work with that would actually make little uh, weights and they would put a hook on the end of the weight or they'd use clothespins. You could put two or three clothespins and basically attach those to that branch so it would go down below the horizontal without having to use a rubber band. I mean, that's just a little technique that growers used to use for years. I, I have to ask you, so fruit begets fruit. So if yeah. the branch thinks, if the branch thinks yeah. um, that it is a fruit bearing branch, it's going to produce more and more fruit. Right. What's the science behind that? Does that have to do with the hormones in the branch or is there something else? Carbohydrates and hormones. Usually it's a combination of oxins, cytokine and an ABA. Uh, three Amazing. hormones that are common within a plant system. So we want to trick our fruit trees. Okay, yeah. a few more questions. We've got lots of questions today. So let's see what we got next. The next email is from Karen. Where are you from, Karen? Oh, I can't see where you're from. Uh, hello, Susan. A little off topic here. Does Dr. Perry have any books out on wine education? <laughs> oh, that would be great. She knows Do my you? background. Uh, actually, we do, but we, we don't have it available to the public. It's a book that is um, published by uh, Great River Learning out of Dubuque, Iowa, and uh, it goes to our students. Um, and actually, the, the revenue that's generated from it helps our operating costs to defray the cost of wine in the course. I no longer teach that course. That was the only way because the university would not give us a budget to be able to purchase wine and uh, support uh, my uh, uh, classroom teachers. So I taught that course for about 10 years. Okay, that's the next book you have to write because you've just, your, your Espalier book is coming out again. You've got time on your hands. That's the book that we are waiting for, okay? Yeah. We'll do another well, show when you get your second, that book out. Right. Okay, another question we have here from Amy, listening to us in Washington, DC. Hi to Susan and Dr. Perry. Amy's question, what is micro-irrigation? Micro-irrigation, uh, another term for it we have is drip or trickle irrigation. And that's where we have a, usually a half inch diameter uh, plastic uh, pipe that is rolled out along a tree row. And we actually uh, puncture that pipe with a small, what's called emitter that controls the amount of gallonage of water that can be emitted. Uh, I use it all the time. I have it here around my home um, and I'm able to control amount of water that goes to each plant uh, in my garden or in the cases of of uh, vineyards and orchards that are used all the time. Okay, so there we go. And we can use those on our espalier fruit trees. Oh, yeah. uh, another question, as they are flying in right now. This one's from Ellen. Ellen writes, I have a young Lapin, 
lap and cherry, I guess. Yeah. It's in second year. It is very healthy. Mm-hmm. It did not fruit or hasn't fruited yet as it's too young. Now she's noticing two bright little flat nubs on each leaflet, every single leaflet. She says, it looks like a weird scale pest, but it isn't, I believe. There are a pair on each set of leaves at the ends of the branches. Can you tell me what it is? No, I'm not familiar with lapins that much, but um, it sounds to me that it is possible that it's a, um, it could be a disease, could back, be bacterial canker because lapins has a suscept- some susceptibility to bacterial canker, Pseudomonas syringae that gets on the leaves. So that's a possibility that's what that is, which can be controlled with some copper uh, or other fungicides that will control that type of disease. Uh, Lapins, I'm trying to remember if it's self-fertile or not. Um, I know Stella is self-fertile, but I'm not sure about Lapins. I would have to look that up to remember if it's self-fertile or not. I will forward you that email. We can continue the conversation after the show. I'm very curious about this. Okay, another excellent email from Barb again. Uh, Barb, and I'm really glad you brought this up, Barb, because it's something I've been thinking about. Barb writes, I recently checked out a 1925 edition of a book called The Lorette System of Pruning, which seemed to focus on cutting the growth back when it was pencil diameter and then almost to the basal leaves, the first set of leaves on each branch. Do you know what are the benefits of this approach to espalier pruning? So the Lorette system, tell us about it. Actually, that's what I use. That's the system I, I actually use. I, I prune back uh, when uh, new branch growth uh, develops uh, eight inches in length. Um, I go back and cut it back to the two basal leaves. And, um, and, and then what that'll do is it'll either um, give you a new flush of uh, growth from the leaf axles below, um, or in some cases, and often it does, depending on the variety, it'll produce new short shoots, in other words, fruiting spurs. So it's actually one of the most um, productive ways to manage um, the espalier system. So I use it in pears, I use it in apples. Um, I don't have any stone fruit on, the, uh, on my uh, espaliers in my gardens, um, but I would imagine that's probably what you'd have to do. And what you're doing is you're cutting back the growth so that you can continue to maintain the definition of the grid or the design that you have. But instead of cutting it all the way back to the original branch where it's arriving, uh, deriving from, you cut it back so that it basically you leave a stub, um, sucking and growth, and then you'll get a response. You may get a flush again, which is fine, and you cut it again. So one of the issues about espalier that people aren't aware of is how time consuming it can be. It's not something you just want to grow it and then let it go. It, It takes, you need to be there every two or three weeks Uh, cutting this growth back. Um, Otherwise, it gets out of hand and you no longer have an espalier design. That's the usual problem for people who want to grow espalier. If you just want to grow it, to grow the tree uh, like a commercial fruit producer, that's fine. Um, But don't expect uh, a tree to stay within its confines uh, of the dynamics of the design. So here, in terms of the Lorette system versus what somebody else might do. So Lorette, you're saying you take, once the sprouts from your structural branches get eight inches, you cut them down to basically just past the first basal bud, the first bud. Uh, Do other... I usually like to leave two axillary buds, yeah. Two buds. Okay, so you want to make sure that there's two buds after. Right. In other systems, do they leave more three, four, five buds, or this is what everybody they might. does? It just depends on the design you have. Uh, if you need, uh, if you have a lot of space between the tiers, in other words, the arms, then yeah, you're fine. But if you don't have, if you have less than, say, uh, 12 to 14 inches or less than around um, 40 centimeters uh, distance between the arms, then you need to bring that down so you can keep the definition of the espalier. 
Gotcha. Okay, we have an email here from, let's see, Jessica, I think. I work on both urban and rural permaculture designs. I'm experimenting with espalier at my own house in London, Ontario, in a pretty free form way with no wires. I have two three-year-old pears and one two-year-old apple. So there's no question here, but I do want to discuss the idea. We've been talking about uh, training your tree into a shape by supporting it and tying it down to some sort of fence or structure. Can you do this without the fence and the structure? Yes, that's what the commercial fruit grower does. Many of them do. Um, not the new ones. Most of the contemporary orchards today all have a fence. They all have um, a high density system with three or four wires and the trees are planted three feet apart. It's called the tall spindle. I would say that 75% uh, of our entire apple industry here in Michigan is uh, grown that way. Um, so, but before that, what growers would do is they grow what's called the central leader system. So you don't have any wires, you don't have, you might have a post, and then what you do is you use rubber bands or other tie downs like a, a kite string, if you will, cotton string. And um, as the branch starts to develop, you basically tie these branches down to the horizontal or below the horizontal. So if you can think of an umbrella, you're gonna keep that umbrella structure uh, going and you're gonna have different tiers of those umbrella, um, umbrella uh, structure. But yeah, you can you can do it without, uh, no doubt. Interesting. Okay, so next question. This is from Ellen uh, Madison, Connecticut. And Ellen writes, just started an espalier a year ago. There's definitely lots to learn. I use glass bottles filled with water to weigh down the branches. Mm -hmm. Does this work with all fruit trees? I've been doing it for my cherry, pear, and peach espalier. Thanks, Ellen. So that's exactly what we were talking about earlier when I mentioned that you have terminal bearing varieties and you wanna bring the branch down below the horizontal, you can go ahead and weight those branches. And that's just another resourceful way of providing weight to basically fool the branch into thinking it has fruit. Gotcha, so, okay. Yeah. So here we've got one more, we're gonna have a commercial break in just a minute. One more quick email from John again, got back to us. John says some follow-up. Ron is correct. My Bell de Bosco apple on EMLA 26 rootstock is incredibly vigorous. Large leaves, thick espalier branches. Sounds like the grower shouldn't have put a Bell de Bosco slow bearer on an EMLA 26 stock, too vigorous. He also says, I am really intrigued by Ron's answer to fully ring bark, the bell de boscoop. I thought uh, doing a full trunk cut into the candy cambium would kill the tree. Whereas an, whereas an incomplete ring cut, leaving some of the cambium unbroken, stresses the tree, but doesn't kill it. So again, let's reassure John, it, that he can do this. He can make a circle around one of those branches and it shouldn't kill that branch. Somehow, I don't know how the nutrition will hop over. How will the nutrition get to the part of the branch that doesn't where the, after the girdling, I don't know. Well, think, think of the xylem tissue still being in, intact. So all you're doing is you're disrupting the phloem. Oh. That's what you're doing. So it's the outer vascular tissue the phloem on there, right underneath the bark that's being disrupted. So you're disrupting materials moving down and you're disrupting materials moving up, but you're not disrupting the water vasculature. So you can do it two ways. I have a very good friend, it's a commercial fruit grower who uses a chainsaw and he does a spiral so that he doesn't go all the way around. Um, and he does that in order to keep the trees under control. And he does that in the spring. This is getting a little too late. So if you go a little bit later, what happens with that type of girdling is that you can kill the tree. But if you just do it now and no later than now, then basically there's a chance for recovery from that stress. And that's the reason why. And it's been done for years. The nectarine growers in California, in order to get size, they did that for years, still do. I know of 
commercial fruit growers in California do just that with nectarines in order to get the fruit size they want. Amazing. Uh, grapes. That's how uh, Thompson Seedless was a, a table grape for years, is they would girdle the Thompson Seedless grape, usually around bloom. So it's usually done around bloom. Okay, well, let's take a moment. Uh, Ron, are you okay hanging in there for a minute? We'll listen sure. to a few words from our sponsors. Sure. Okay, great. So let's do that. And when we come back, let's talk more about pruning espalier, training it. Uh, what kind of um, structures do we want to tie them down on? All that stuff. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. And uh, Great. Okay, so you are listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm Susan Poisner, author of the Fruit Tree Care books, Growing Urban Orchards, and my new book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast. We'll be back just, just in a minute after the break. Hi there, you're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101 and I'm your host, Susan Poisner. In the show today, we've been talking about espalier fruit trees. These are small fruit trees that are trained to grow up against fences. And if they're cared for properly, espalier fruit trees can be both beautiful and productive. So my guest today is Ron Perry, retired professor emeritus of horticulture from Michigan State University and an expert at espalier growing. Ron is also the co-author of the book, Espalier Fruit Gardens in Northern Climates, Creating Fruit Trees as Art. So Ron, we have another, there's so many things I wanna talk about, but let's see, we've got another email here. Um, and this one is from Pam. Hello, Urban Forestry. Does Dr. Perry have a newsletter av available or a weekly or monthly update on the subject of espalier? Uh, no, I do not. Sorry about oh. that. Okay, but, something uh, to put on your to-do list then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> something to think about after you write your book on wine tasting, I yes. think. I forgot, yeah. to, I forgot to uh, mention that I did look it up in the break related to that question about the Laffin's cherry. Yeah, and it is self fertile. And it also like Stella comes from the breeding program at the Summerlin Research Station there in, uh, in, in British Columbia. Um, but it, it is a self fertile variety. It's self fertile. Okay, and we got another email from Ellen okay. here about that very topic. So let's see what she says. Susan, I'm so excited. I just, just discovered this online. So she was Googling about the bumps on her leaves. My bumps on my cherry tree leaves are not a problem. They actually encourage beneficial insects. Um, don't have to talk about in the air. Oh, she's saying yeah, we don't have to talk about it on the air. Well, we're on the air and we're talking about it. Right. Um, I'm going to look at this further. I'm very curious about that. And who knows, maybe this is a topic for another show. I want to know. Okay, so now let's go back to espalier pruning. So you get this young fruit tree, making sure you've got the right cultivar and the right rootstock, and you have to plant it somewhere. If you are going to build some sort of trellis or fence, What's the simplest kind of trellis or fence you can create in order to support an espalier fruit tree? Oh, probably the simplest would be the horizontal fence system. And that's where you basically have uh, wires uh, about anywhere from uh, nine to 14 inches apart on a, on a grid, if you will, going vertical. And so the wires are then um, stretched between posts um, and then you can grow the tree on that. You do not want to grow a tree in a spalier directly on a fence or a rock wall or a concrete wall um, because you'll get a certain amount of uh, 
deterioration of the fence wall um, in that particular situation. Plus, you really need to have some ventilation and air movement between the wall or the fence. And so usually it's best to come out within six inches to a foot from that wall if you're going to have it on a, on a fence or a wall. And so you have its own separate um, support system. And in this case, if you're talking about the fence, it's pretty easy. You put uh, a couple of posts together, um, one at one end and one at the other. And depending how, how far apart, you can put as many trees as you want, basically, in that, in that fence system. But basically, our commercial fruit growers don't go farther than around 40 to 50 feet apart. Um, and so that you get plenty of, of stretch with the wire. Our commercial growers use high tensile wire. It's much cheaper. What I tell our um, espalier growers is instead to just get the uh, vinyl coated uh, cable wire that you can get at a local hardware store. And then what you're gonna do is use, um, use a little clamp so that you can loop um, as you go through the, the hole or the staple um, connecting that that cable up to the vertical post to support it um, then you can clamp it and then at the other end use a turnbuckle or some method uh, like what the uh, vineyardists do where they just use a uh, an adjustable uh, clamp at the other end as a tensioner because what happens is the wire over time or the cable over time will start to lose its tension and then you basically lose the ability to train on a surface that is taut. And instead you get branch growth that starts to loop and bend down uh, simply because the support isn't there. Is so that, you've got, yeah, so uh -huh. you've got your two, your two fence posts, let's say they're at maximum 40 feet apart, they could be a lot shorter. Yep. How many espalier fruit trees can you fit in that space if i have a small garden let's say my small garden is 20 feet deep can i get a number of trees there um espalier well, if fruit you trees? were four feet apart uh, which is you know four to five or six feet apart let's say it's five feet that means you can put eight trees between those two two posts if you want which means that. I could have eight different varieties yeah. of apples in oh, yeah. one small garden. Yeah. How, how many apples do you think I would get out of each of those trees if they're really that close? Well, if they're on M9 or they're on B9, they're on CG11, any of those dwarfing rootstocks, you're talking, if you do everything right, you can get as much as a half a bushel of uh, apples by, by either the second leaf or the third growing season. That's fantastic. So you yeah. could have a significant number of apples oh, yeah. and you can think in advance to have some apples that ripen in August and some in September, some October. It could be beautiful as long as you've right. got the sunny garden and willing to take hands on care. So you mentioned earlier, espalier fruit trees need a lot of fussing and pruning. Yes. What, what is the main time of year? Like, do you do a lot of that in the winter or never, you don't Almost touch them? all of it during the summer. Okay. You'll do a certain amount in the winter. And mainly what we do in the winter time is a term we use in the commercial fruit industry called recycling, where basically we will shorten the, ex the extended growth uh, so that we go back to growth that's nearest the arm that supports it. So that if you're extending, for example, growth each year, because you'll get new growth, right? And let's say it's one foot or six inches or eight inches above the branch support system. Now what happens is you're losing the identity of that design. So now you need to go you need to cut that growth out and go back to something that is closer to the origin uh, original branch. The permanent so could arm. we say that in the winter, we're looking at the design in the winter, yeah. we're saying, OK, my arms are branches that are you know tied up against this fence. They've gotten too long. I can't yes. leave them that long. Yeah. Cut them. That's the winter. 
but you don't just cut with a heading cut, you make a thinning cut. Okay. So you're gonna cut at, as close to the origin of that branch as possible or back to a, another fruit spur or something like that, that is down lower near the arm. And you start from scratch. Here so you've spent a years. Cut. A heading yeah. cut means you're making a cut between the terminal bud, that last bud, and the origin of that branch. And so you leave a stub. You do not want to do that, so, gotcha. especially winter time. You can do that in the summertime and get away with it. You cannot do that in the summertime. The other thing, excuse me, wintertime. The other thing you're going to do is remove water sprouts. And in some cases, if you have too strong a rootstock or real fertile soil, you may have a lot of pruning to do just to remove water sprouts. Hmm. So water sprouts, water sprouts are, are vertical vegetative growth. And uh, they are not reproductive. Eventually, within say three years, they can become reproductive, but generally they're going to be vegetative and they're an abhorrence to any espalier system or plant. Mm -hmm. So we want to get rid of them. Yep. And the winter is an okay time to do that. It is. And you'll need to do it again during the summer because you'll get some water sprouts to start to take off that are much longer and more vegetative and vertical in habit. And those need to be removed almost immediately. I, a lot of times I do that with my hands, just mm -hmm. rip them out. <gasps> pruning, pruning is best. But if you're in, if you happen to be near the plant and you see one, just get rid of it right away. Prune it, oh. pinch it out with your hands. Okay, we got some, some more questions here. One of them is from Riley. Uh, Riley writes, hi, Susan, love the show today. Excellent advice and information. Love you from Orlando, Florida. Oh, fantastic. That's so great. It is a very interesting show today. And here we have from John. John is our Belle de Bosco person in Toronto. So John writes, does Ron graft onto his espalier branches? to create multi-variety espaliers. If he does, how many fruiting buds does he usually leave on the scions he is attaching? Okay, so I don't graft, I bud. And the reason why I don't graft is because you, you disturb too much of the infrastructure system. So I usually bud, the, the, the limitation to budding is the growth needs to be no greater in age than two or three years. Um, so you're going to take and either use a chip bud or a T bud and insert that bud on uh, a two-year-old branch, a one-year-old or a two-year-old branch of wood and then force that bud. If you can't that same season, you can force it the following season. Um, and then, yeah, you can have, uh, I have, I have trees that have two or three different varieties on them. And it's a way to provide pollinizer source for pollen for um, where you need, um, uh, you need it for those varieties that are unself fruitful. His second question here is about another espa uh, established espalier he has. Okay, so John writes, raccoons broke a branch on my established fan espalier, ruining the design. What does Ron recommend as the best way to restore the missing arm of the fan? Try grafting a new scion on or cutting back further on the established branch stub, hoping for an existing bud to fire up and create a new branch? Yes, the latter. Uh, because if you're going to bud or graft, you've got to find a good spot in order to insert that bud or graft. If it's older wood, then you have to graft. You don't have a choice. What are you mm -hmm. going to graft? onto what 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 is going to be that um that structure that you're going to graph so uh you're really a lot better off cutting back to say a four or five inch stub and see if you can get adventitious shoots to grow from it and then you can choose one of those to be the the new leader of the fan uh element Okay, now we have a question here from Julie. So Julie says, can I still train a two-year-old tree into an espalier? So Julie has an existing tree she bought last year, just got a few branches on it. And she's like, oh, maybe I can turn that into an espalier. So no fence there yet, but maybe she can put one up. 
as long as she has the right rootstock. If, Keeps, if yeah. she doesn't know what the rootstock is, and if it says semi dwarf, she's got a problem. Right. She'll be fighting it. If she, all she wants to do is grow it as a normal tree um, and not necessarily spalier, no problem at all. Um, the problem you get into with branches that are existing, they're woody, is now you still have to train them, but it's very difficult once the lignin starts to set in, the woody portion starts to set in. And once you have a woody branch, it's very difficult to bend without breaking. And so, that, that's such an important point. So it we is. have to, yeah, a lot of times you're to. better off cutting back, uh, cut those branches to a five or six inch stub, and then forcing adventitious shoot growth that you then train how you want it to develop. Uh, so you take the succulent new growth that responds to that heading cut, and then you select one of those and then train that. Now you're, you're much further along than if you try to take something that's already woody. Uh, if it's horizontal, then you may be in luck and you can train that and continue to train it if it's horizontal. And we've got one more question here, Alexis from Ottawa. Um, so Alexis wants to know, when do you prune and shape pear cordons and plum fans in zone five? Uh, I have a pair with one established tier or horizontal arm, and I'm wondering when I should make the second cut on the central trunk. So that's for the second wire. And can I cut the outward growing branches off my plum fan all year, or is there a best time to do this? So the, Alexis's question is great to sort of summarize everything we've talked about today. So let's answer the first, the last question, the second question first on the plum, and then we can go back to the, uh, the, the pear tree. So on the plum, basically you can prune as soon as you get growth, as soon as you get eight or nine inches of growth, like I mentioned earlier, and you're gonna cut back to basal buds, um, and then you can train. So um, the best time, if, if you can't do any pruning during the summertime, is gonna be mid-July um, in our climate. Um, and so you can train for sure during that period. And the reason is, is because when you start to prune earlier, you'll get a lot more flush of um, compensatory growth in response to any pruning cut you make. Um, if you do it in July, you'll get less of that. So you get less water sprouts produced from any, any cutting that's done in July. Um, and then you wanna shut it down mid-August or later, because what you have to do is you have to live with it and prune it out during the winter time. Because if you make a pruning cut after mid-August, um, you're subjecting that plant to um, winter damage. And because you're not, you're, you're basically delaying the deacclimation period because you need to get that tree into a um, acclimatizing uh, mode so that it's ready to go into fall. If you make that pruning cut late after the 15th of August, 20th of August, then what happens is you basically slow that process of acclimation. You may even generate some new growth and that's not good. So let's okay. go back to the pear. Mm -hmm. So I try to tell all the commercial growers as well as espalier growers that if you're trying to grow a tree, and you want branches to develop at various levels and tiers, it's best to be patient and allow that apical bud to continue to grow, the terminal bud that on the, the main leader of the trunk, and don't cut it. If you cut it, what'll happen is you'll set that tree back uh, on reproductive uh, mode, and instead it'll become more vegetative, and so you slow the process of fruiting and reproductivity. Um, so if you keep that apical or terminal bud intact, as it's growing, then you have more potential for um, developing the reproductivity. So what'll happen is on that pear tree, on that, that uh, growth that's above that second tier, that, excuse me, that first tier, is you'll, you'll get some um, 
some axillary leaves, buds that develop at the nodes, and they'll just sit there. They won't necessarily move. Then what you can do is wait till next spring. They will break out, and then you can choose the ones you want to keep to fit into your design. Um, but keep that apical bud intact for as long as you can. And then at a certain point, after several years, you don't want it to grow vertical anymore, then you can cut it out during the summertime. Interesting, because in a, a, some instructions will say that you you yeah. uh, you I cut know. your tree initially right yeah. before the wire, and then it breaks yeah. up, and then it keeps growing before the second yeah. wire, you cut it again. Yeah. So you say that we just doesn't- We haven't done that in commercial fruit growing in 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to be what we used to do with central leader tree development where we would make that cut to force the tiers we wanted. But you slow, but what we learned with dwarfing rootstocks and with high density systems, and you want to start paying off for your investment early in commercial fruit growing, is you slow the process of, of getting a return on your investment early by doing that. So we don't do that anymore. We, we tell the growers, keep the bud, um, apical bud intact. If it comes from a nursery, they've probably cut that top uh, part off to send it to you, um, then you take that new shoot as the leader and keep the apical bud intact. So I, we've got to wrap up in just a minute. Okay. It's time for our contest, but I want to ask you about your book. So this wonderful little book that I discovered on Kindle, yeah. um, you guys have just reissued a new version of it. Yes. Where I understand that the money is going to, tell me where the money goes to that you're raising with this. So 70% of the proceeds are going to the operating budget of our horticulture gardens. And that's really important because our horticulture gardens are self-funded, meaning we don't get very much support from the university. And uh, for the gardens, we get a little bit, um, but it's a real kind of a problem and a stress point for us in the gardens to keep them and maintain them as well as we can. So a lot of donations, um, a lot of money that comes in for uh, flower testing and that kind of thing will go in towards the operating budget. And so this uh, is just something we just developed and we're hoping we can get more books on various topics from various faculty members in our department uh, to help our gardens out. That's, that's the real purpose of it. Yep. So for listeners who love this show, and I can tell from the emails, a lot of listeners learned so much from you, Ron. Guys, if you love this show, go to amazon.com or amazon.ca and grab your copy of Espalier Fruit Gardens in Northern Climates by Ron. Ron, thank you so much for spending the time. I got another email from John who says, uh, thank you so much for today's podcast. Incredibly helpful. So we all really enjoyed having this time to talk with you. Thanks for coming on the show today. You're welcome. I thoroughly enjoy the opportunity. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning into the show today. If you want to listen again or download other episodes of this show, go to orchardpeople.com slash podcasts. And you'll learn all sorts of things about growing fruit trees. You can also go to orchardpeople.com slash articles where I have articles about fruit tree care. And I have my brand new fruit tree care book called Grow Fruit Trees Fast, which is designed for you to, for people who are busy. You can read that book in literally one hour, depending on how fast or slow you read. And it gives you a great overview of how to grow fruit trees to make sure you're feeding them properly, caring for them, protecting them from pests and diseases. And there is a section on pruning as well. So you can find that book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast, on Amazon, or you can find it on orchardpeople.com slash grow fruit. So that's it for today's show. I hope you're going to join me again next month when we're going to talk about another great fruit tree care topic. Thank you so much for listening in and thanks for those who participated. I will see you next time. Bye for now.